Um, I wanted to start out by asking, do you think that some or certain breeds are more prone to chase behaviour? Uh, undoubtedly, yeah. Some, I mean, the, the clues in the in the in the breed really. Um, some dogs have been bred to chase, uh, and and those dogs are going to be the ones that um, are more focused on chase behaviour anyway. Yeah. Do you find that when you're working with um, dogs for the chasing, that you that the same breeds keep cropping up again and uh, again? Not again? necessarily. Um, I mean, there are there are uh, breeds that are highly represented. If you if we were to take a, a broad spectrum, um, but by the same token, most of the dogs that tend to come as being represented as having a chase problem don't really have a predatory chase problem. They have a lack of recall. Okay. All right. And how do you differentiate the two when you're working um, with them? Well, lack of recall is. Um, well, it's a bit difficult to, to, to separate them out, really. Um, but most most dogs that come with what they almost think is a predatory chase problem can be um, improved massively. Um, I don't like to use the term cured because it's not a disease, um, but can be can be made acceptable, if you like, um, through improving the relationship with the owner and concentration on the recall, and that, that's all it takes. It's, have you got a method that you kind of... Um, go back to with the recall? Um, the, it's not a, always when you're training anything in, in with dogs, it's not initially about the tra training the exercise. It's never about teaching the dog to come back. It's always about um, your relationship with the dog to start with. And, and that's your start point for, for almost any change in behavior in dogs is, is the, the actual relationship with the owner that needs to be on an even keel first. Um, after that, you can add on all kinds of training. I mean, there's, there's, there are many, many ways to train a dog to come back when it's called. Um, yeah, go on. And, and how do you, um, have you, well, then I asked the same question about the relationship. Sure. Have you got a, a certain um, calculated approach to improving relationship? Um, or is it... at, at the risk of, um, of over self-publicizing, I've, I've written a booklet called Guide and Control, Guide and Control Your Pet Dog's Behavior. Um, which, we, which I also talk about in, in all my seminars, because that's really the foundation. It's about giving your dog guidance, and from that guidance comes control, and from the control gives your ability to give guidance. So it's a, it's a nicely circular um, arrangement whereby the dog gets what the dog wants and the owner gets what the owner wants. If you're starting off with a dog with predatory chase, are you still essentially starting with the relationship first or is a um yeah the relationship is is certainly part of what you start with dogs with predatory chase what you what you tend to find with dogs that um, are chasing things that the owners wish they weren't doing um is that there's there's some kind of imbalance in the in the dog's emotional balance as well um i mean cope talk about it um at, at great length uh, but in that respect, they're, they're right in as much as most dogs have an imbalance in, in what they're getting out of life. Uh, and so dogs that are chasing things that the owners wish they weren't um, are looking for a form of excitement or contentment that they're not getting in other ways. Um, and then the first, the first stage really is to try and balance out that, that, that dog's emotions. And the relationship with their owner will be part of that. In the last podcast with um, Jemima, we had a conversation about um, aloof dogs and, and dogs that were aloof. Um, and do you find that those kind of dogs are harder to build a relationship with? Um, it's a, every, every single dog that I've ever owned, I've had a different relationship with. Uh, and I think that applies to everybody. Every, every person has a different relationship with every dog they own. Uh, and it's not... It's not a, a one-size-fits-all kind of thing. It's fitting ourselves to the dog and fitting the dog to ourselves. So to, to answer your question more directly, um, it's not necessarily more difficult to have a relationship with aloof dogs, uh, although I, I, I would find it a, a bit of a generalisation to call dogs aloof. Um, the... The question is is finding the right relationship that that dog wants. Okay. No, we um. I only bring it up. We, well, me and Jemima managed to start a bit of a war in the uh, comment section about okay. loose dogs. <clears throat> so I just wanted to just 
thought you might weigh in on um what you think about people that or oh, well, some of the breed standards that call for aloofness as a as a trait in in certain breeds. Okay, which ones are those? Well, I well when I say it, I'm thinking of Chow Chows, I'm thinking of Akitas, um. Yeah, but well, those are the two breeds that really stick out to me. But then I guess even huskies to to okay. a degree. Okay, um, there's been some work done on um, the brain um, setup of different breeds of dogs, um, and, and what to, to to make a huge generalisation, um, you can break dogs down into or breeds of dogs down into types that have been bred to work with people and dogs that have been bred to work on their own. Um, and it all goes back to what the dog was originally for. And so if a dog a dog breed has been developed to, to work on its own and make all its own decisions, then that's going to be more difficult to um, control than a dog that is has been bred to work with people. So, I mean, the, the prime example of dogs that are bred to work with people is a border collie. Um, mm-hmm. Because a border collie will take instruction and look for instruction at a quarter of a mile away, possibly more, as far away as it can hear and see. Um, so uh, training a border collie uh, is relatively easy in the respect that it's looking to take instruction all the time. It's looking to you for guidance all the time. And all you've got to do is supply that and the, and the dog will basically do somersaults for you just because you're there. Um, there's uh, there's uh, some research, you'll forgive me if I can't remember it at the moment, that, that suggests that border collies have, actually have more dopamine receptors in parts of the brain that they use for communication. So actually communicating with a border collie is, is almost self-rewarding for it. So is in those breeds that are bred to work uh, without humans, um, do you find that the predatory chasing and getting over that is, is diff- more difficult? or um, It can be. It depends what we're trying to tap into. Um, uh, so long as we have a, a good um, relationship with the dog, a, a, a trusting relationship where the dog trusts you and you can trust the dog to um, uh, mostly uh, be in line with what you want it to do, um, then I think at that point, really, we're on an even keel. Um, I mean, dogs that are into people are just really easy to train. It's the, it's the ones that aren't as much into people that you might have more difficulty with. It just means you do more work, that's all. Okay, so do you, do you feel then you can stop any dog from chasing? Um, I am very confident that I could stop any dog from chasing, but that's not really the question. The question is whether the owner can do it or not. Uh, and, and that's where the difficulty comes in. Well, I mean, it's becoming a bigger thing in America is um, day training, where the trainer trains the dog and then returns it to the person. I mean, how do you feel about that? Is that something that could have an application in, in predatory training? Um, dogs? Probably not. Um, day training, I would probably consider to be useful for little things like manners, um, for teaching sits and not to jump up at people, uh, kind of your general generic basic training. Um, I think for uh, more complicated things, um, you would need to um, develop a, a relationship with a dog where it's in tune with, with the individual person, and that's where the difficulty comes in. That's why I'm very confident that I can stop any dog um, in the same way that, that I can, I'm, I'm very confident that I could take any dog with aggression issues uh, and make it make it behave in an acceptable way, not necessarily a, a lovely, nice way, but certainly acceptable way. Um, but I'm not always convinced that the owner can do that. So with, with any dog with aggression issues, um, I, I I haven't because, I mean, uh, any that I don't think I could control. Yeah, and I, I would, I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not being beheaded with that. I think there are many dog trainers that would be in the same position that I am. Once, once you're a professional dog trainer, then then you should be able to train any dog. It's like saying I'm a I'm a lion trainer, but I can only train nice lions. Yeah, well, um, I mean, there's oh, there's well, I would counteract that with saying there's people, um, there's dogs out there with with issues in their brain, with being chemical imbalances, etc., where you're never really gonna 
you're never really going to get them to a normal point. Certainly, without not without medication. Would you agree uh, with that or not? That would be a veterinary question that I'm not qualified to answer. But um, there is the likelihood that there are some dogs that are, as you say, chemically unbalanced. Um, that that really would be so difficult to work with. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I would I would like to work with any dog with aggression issues. <laughs> yeah. All I'm saying is that I, I feel that, that it's possible to get to a level of skill um, uh, uh, to be able to work with any dog. Yeah, I mean, I've come across dogs before that seem to have had a re- relatively normal up bringing like they haven't been abused etc um but they just seem a little bit off or they they have issues with um just being very quick to bite or etc etc um i don't know if you've ever come across stuff oh, like yeah, that as absolutely. well lots of them yeah yeah um most most dog aggression and, and most dog problems aren't caused by being dogs being abused um they're, they're caused by either either poor social skills or, or poor handling on the part of the owner. Sure. So, but do you think bad breeding also comes into that as uh, well? There are traits that can be inherited by dogs uh, that um, don't help with the way that they later behave. But um, bad breeding, bad breeding is a bit of a, an inverted commas uh, catch-all phrase, isn't it? Um, the the yeah, problem sure. with it is, is that usually the whole setup's quite bad. Um, so it's not only the, the kind of um, who your parents are that cause the problem, it's the way in which the bitch is kept when she's when she's having the pups um, and what the pups are learning in those early days. And we've got lots and lots of evidence that, that, that animals still in the womb uh, are strongly affected by outside influences. Sure. Um, a lot of your... I, I mean, when I was... Because I went to one of your seminars last year and... A lot. I remember a lot of it was also conditioning, wasn't it? So I mean, conditioning in terms of um, to uh, like a new toy was a lot of it, wasn't it? Oh, like, absolutely. Um, oh, well, I'll yeah. let you explain well, it. I think you took much better job than me. The problem with with things like predatory change and even aggression, for that point, is that people want to deal with it as and when it's happening, and they don't care about anything else the rest of the time. Uh, they just say, well, uh, I want to be able to click my fingers and my dog stop chasing something, or you know, I want to blink my eyes and my dog will not be aggressive towards other dogs. Well, that's not the start point. The start point's way, way back. Um, and I've already talked about balancing the dog's emotions, but there are, there are lots of things that we need to get in place before we can even think about controlling our dog in situations where the dog's extremely highly aroused. Um, and, and part of that is things like conditioning to new toys, teaching to retrieve, um, teaching a dog to leave things, um, and it's all it's all background work that needs to be done, and, and that's the work part that people don't seem to to understand or, or don't seem to want to do. One thing I've really been thinking about recently is um, teaching puppies to like playing tug and various toy and um, with toys, um, and how important that really is. That seems to be something that's not really spoken about. But if you're gonna Certainly, if you're going to do any training, but really, I I mean, if I would do it with any puppy, really, is con- teaching them to love tug. Do you find that as, okay. as well? Um, I wouldn't be too focused on teaching them to love tug. Uh, I would be quite focused on teaching them to love leaving it so they can have another tug. <laughs> so, so the control aspect of it, um, tug will be innately reinforcing anyway. Dogs just like to tug. Um, if we if we need to teach it, then Possibly we, it's not a road that I would be interested in going down. Um, I would be more interested in teaching retrieve where dogs are, are happy to give something up in order to get something back. Well, I, I would say that that's part of the process of teaching tug is, is the leave it and the retrieve, okay. etc. I mean, I'm think. let me give two examples. So um, firstly, as a, just to contrast these two, my little Chihuahua puppy farm mix that has never been played with. Um, as a result, doesn't like tug. Now, I'm convinced that if I had him as a puppy and I played tug with him, he would play tug, but he never had a human to play with, so he's never learned the game of tug. Um, whereas, and then I contrast that to Tico, a Doberman I work with. Um, when we first started working with him, he he wasn't really that into tug. So I made a conscious effort to play a lot of tug with him, 
And now he loves, like, we can reward him entirely with Tug. He absolutely loves Tug. So that's that would be the contrast, I would say. Do, I mean, have you found that kind of thing as well? Well, no, that's not a bad example, because he, you're using the Tug as a reward, and, the, and you do need to build up uh, things other than um, food treats, for example, in order to use them as rewards for dogs. Um, dogs can find lots and lots of things rewarding. We've just got to find the right... Um, the right buttons to press uh, and then they'll be able to get their reward from doing that um, however you need to be careful not to go over the top with it um, and whilst you as a professional dog trainer I'm sure your your tug will be uh, within the right boundaries and the dog will always leave it when it's asked to leave it uh, the difficulty that owners have is they, they enjoy the, the dog seems like it's enjoying the game so much that they keep on going, keep on going, and keep on going, and it can build it up too far. And I, I, I've seen um, um, in the very recent past, um, I saw um, um, a bull terrier um, that he hadn't even been encouraged to play that very much, um, but he, he'd taken it to another level, and and he he was playing tug as a almost two year old as though he was um, an eight-week-old puppy with absolutely no inhibition at all. Um, and he made quite a mess of, of, a, of a person who he was just playing with, um, but because he liked Tug so much, he was using it on people too. Um, and that's one of the extremely few times that I've come close to being bitten by a dog, um, and he took a lump out of my coat. Uh, but he was only do- yeah. it was only fun, but had he actually made contact with me, I'd have lost a, 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 quite a lot of blood. Yeah, so I mean that emphasizes that yeah, I I really still think the the tug is great to play with dogs. You just need to have that control in there as well. You can, it's Absolutely. like anything, you know. You, you need to have some boundaries without tr- without trying to sound too pack leader. No, no. Need to, yeah. Well, it's it's yeah. yeah, it's the when we get to this stage, then that's the end of the game because we're going too far and we're just going to be silly. Um, it's it's the same with 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 children. You know, children do the same thing. You you get into a game that you're enjoying, and they just get sillier and sillier. And 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 somebody needs to take that adult role and say, "Wait, well, hey, just you know, calm down a minute. You know, we'll just take a time out." So are you are you then talking about um, more like arousal levels and watching the level of arousal yeah, in the dog? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, yeah. Once once they get too aroused, um, then we start to lose all kinds of. Um, um, I'll kind of put it in a, in a human way. Manners. We we kind of lose our manners, and you and you get your fingers bitten, and um, and they they don't know when to stop. Um, particularly in the uh, in the more combative breeds. So so in your staffies and your and your pit bull types, you know your staffy crosses. Um, they they really can get so into it that nothing else matters to them anymore. Yeah, I remember a large part of your seminar was talking about building up. Um, well, not necessarily tug, but building up a, a toy as to be a huge reinforcer. Yeah, we, we, you're certainly going to need that in in predatory chase. My my um, my philosophy, if you like, is always to give the dog what it wants, what it needs, but in a way that's appropriate to us. So if we're going to ask our dog not to chase things, we're going to have to provide something else for it to chase. Um, and so we we need to build up something that's really important. Um, for the dog to chase. Um, I had an email from a, from a, I get lots of emails um, asking about all kinds of things, but, but a lot about predatory chase. Um, and I, I, I don't, I don't converse by email because it's just not possible to do. And so if you, if I was to start a conversation, um, then it would just get too complicated and I might do more harm than good. So I'd, I'd, I'd rather refer them to, to somebody close to them that could help them with it. Um, but I got a, a, an email from a lady saying that her dog is obsessed with footballs. And she, um, whenever she takes him for a walk and the, the dog sees a, a game of football, then he, he whines and screams and wants to go and join in the game of football. Well, the obvious thing to me is get a football because <laughs> that's what the dog wants. Yeah. And we can use that. And if the dog's really, really keen on footballs, then we'll, we'll play football with it and we'll get that under control. And it's the same with predatory chase. If you can find something that the dog is really, really into, then, or, or if you can't find it, develop it. Um, then we can take control of the behaviour because the dog will now do anything in order to get access to the thing that you've got. Okay. Um, so then you would put on training on top to prevent that dog from then just going and 
running into the middle of a football game. Absolutely. I, I yeah, you, you, you start with your layers of training and then the first one is you have to enjoy this game uh, before we can progress and then we start to put control in. Um, and so we, we I, I, I explain at greater length in the, in the seminars and there's, there's a bit about it in the book as well, um, where you start to um, manipulate the, the, the toys, the articles, so that the one that you've got is always more exciting than the one that the dog's got. Okay. Yeah, because uh, again, I mean, in your seminar, and you'll do a much better job than me of explaining this, you were talking about um, how if we stop, we, well, a really important part of it is stopping the dog from practicing, chasing, whatever it is, say squirrels, sure. deer, whatever. Um, so that seems to contrast a little bit with the, the football. Uh, it, it does, but if there are footballs that we can control that are more attractive than footballs that, that are being played with by kids in the park, um, then we can, we can change that balance. We can change that balance in our favour. So that the dog always wants our football more than the football that's over there. Okay. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, you were also... T- I remember you talking about um, how... And I might be wrong on this. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, we don't want to use a toy that's too similar to the uh, whatever the object is that or the animal is that the dog wants to chase. Yeah, sure. Right? But a lot of the problems come with uh, uh, animals like rabbits. And dogs, dogs will chase rabbits and not stop. Um, so if we want to change our toy, um, change our dog's focus onto something that it finds equally exciting, then the most exciting thing at the moment is rabbits. Um, but we want to change it to something we can control. However, if we make the thing that we're controlling too much like a rabbit, we haven't really prevented our dogs from chasing rabbits. We've prevented them from, from or, or we've encouraged them to chase a rabbit that we now also possess. But we can we can start off with something a bit like a rabbit, as long as it ends up not being a rabbit. It's it's a bit yeah. It's, you're right. It is a bit difficult to explain in short sentences, isn't it? Yeah, I was just so what's the um what's the importance then of of ending up with an object that's not like a rabbit? So say you have like a rabbit skin like uh toy sure. type thing and you're and you're trying to stop the dog from chasing rabbits, is that then I mean what's the problem um, with that? If the dog's completely focused on rabbits and it's still chasing a rabbit that you've got then really it's about the availability of the rabbit. So if if the rabbit that you've got's in your pocket and the other rabbit is under the dog's nose, then it'll probably take the one under under the dog's nose rather than the one in your pocket. However, if we've now built something that's more important to the dog, um, I don't know, let's say, just for example, a tennis ball, it probably wouldn't be, but it's just easier to talk about. So if the, dog's, if the dog now finds tennis balls more interesting than rabbits, then if we've got a tennis ball in our pocket and the rabbit's under the dog's nose, you'll still be able to say, I've got the tennis ball, at which point the dog won't chase the rabbit because he prefers tennis balls. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it, um, at the same time, if, if we condition our rabbit toy to, to have, have a word, say that um, the dog sees a rabbit and then we say toy or yeah. whatever, and the dog's had so many repetitions of that that it's like sure, conditioning, yeah. isn't it? That the dog instantly turns and yeah. is on the toy. Would that, is that realistic or is that uh, not going to happen? No, that's, that's, that's fine. So long as the dog understands that it's different from a rabbit. By which point, if you've done your conditioning, then your, your, the rabbit thing in your pocket isn't like a rabbit anymore. Okay. Uh, I'm just a little bit confused as to why it, why it can't be like uh, a rabbit. Because it's easier to change than it is to differentiate. Okay. What, what um, do you mean? It's, it can be difficult for the dog to differentiate between the rabbit on the ground and the rabbit skin in your pocket because it's still a rabbit. So the one in your yeah. pocket has to become more valuable than the one on the ground. Okay. So, okay. so if, if the two, two similar, think... then, then the dog will still take the other one as well. Yeah, I can see what you're saying, I think. Um, so we, we're not really stopping the dog from chasing. We're just oh, managing it. Yeah, maybe. yeah. We're always managing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I've got you. Okay. I understand that. <laughs> um, you've been doing your seminars for. It seems like you've been doing them quite a while. The two, the yeah, <laughs> the chasing one and the um, sure. dogs that bite. Um, what do you think is is the reason for having such kind of long term success with 
with those two um, talks? It's a good question. Um, because people have still got dogs that chase things and people have still got aggressive dogs, I guess. Um, there are whole new generations of them coming through. Um, and unfortunately, we're still in a position where we haven't got all dogs under all control all of the time. I doubt very much whether we're ever going to get to that, are we? Otherwise, otherwise you'd be out of okay. the job as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, has your talk kind of evolved as you've been doing, giving it, or has it stayed mostly um, the same? I think the basics are going to stay the same, um, but there's always little bits that get changed as we go along. There's always little bits and pieces here and there, um, and a lot of it comes from feedback from, from people at the talks as well, um, because it's as, it's as much a learning process for me. Uh, I find out all, I've never done a talk where I haven't learned something from it, um, and I, I really value that, that part where people feed back as well. Are you someone that goes to a lot of other people's talks? Um, I do well? go to other people's talks. Um, however, um, it's difficult to find new ones, to be honest with you. Yeah, you've been to yeah, so many I'm, now at this point. I, I'm, at the minute, I'm feeling like I've covered most of it. Um, and, the, and I mean, I've been around for quite a while, to be honest. Um, uh, and there's only so much you can take in from other people until you're kind of full up and there's nothing new. Yeah, sure. I mean, before the podcast, we were talking a little bit about Grisha. Do you, do you go to, or have you kept up to date with kind of the more modern stuff? Yeah, like sure, and, and sure. Like because that? anything that comes along has got to be worth looking at. Um, and it, it needs taken apart in my own head apart from anything else. So yeah, I mean, I get all the books, I, I read all the uh, all the uh, all the new stuff that comes out. But to be honest, it's it's mostly recycled old stuff now. You know, there's there's very little that's that's new. Um, certainly, very little that's new that's got any value. Uh huh. No, I mean, I've really got into recently got into the empowerment stuff. Okay. So all of the new empowerment training that's come along. Have you been uh, following? I've that? kind of heard of it, yeah, but it's not something that I've got into deeply. Like the, um, and well, Grisha again, but also like Shirak Patel stuff. Um, where it's mostly to do with handling and stuff like that. Again, handling skills aren't new. Uh, handling skills have been, have been around for years. Um, oh, and, and all, all we're doing is, is rehashing things in a different way for a different audience, uh, which is fine. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not poo pooing it, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done. Well, um, and if we can get across to more people by saying things in a different way, that's fine. But it's not new. Well, I think the the empowering aspect of it is is what's new is um, it it's not handling in the typical sense of the old counter conditioning model. Well, it is still technically counter conditioning, but it's empowering the dog to choose the rate at which it progresses. Yeah, essentially. Sure. I anyway, um, we 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 move on. Um. What well, I was going to start talking about your um, work in the police, but then also what? again was talking about previous podcasts. Um, me and Jemima were talking about the replacement or the kind of gradual replacement of German shepherds for Malinois in the police forces. Well, what do you think that? What do you think um, about that? Uh, how can I put this while being politically correct? Um, I think they're making a mistake. Um, I think the Mallies are easier to train in the in the right. Um, we I I was uh, kind of there when when the change from German Shepherds to Mallies started, uh, and it purely came about because um, we the the police forces in the UK couldn't get hold of decent German Shepherd dogs to train. A lot of them were failing, uh, and and a lot of them were failing um, uh, on bite work, um, which was partly as a consequence of the way that. German Shepherds were being bred in the UK uh, because they were being bred to be nicer pets, uh, which is great. But the bite work was suffering. Um, and so police forces, uh, probably led by the Met uh, and um, to some extent Manchester, um, imported uh, bred to work German Shepherd Schutzhund dogs from the continent. Um, and that was all going reasonably well. Uh, but unfortunately, they, they came into contact with continental Schutzhund trainers um, who prefer the Mali. Now, the, the big difference with the Mali is the bite, because the Mali absolutely loves to bite. 
And if we talk about um, inherited motor patterns, you were talking about dogs that uh, are easier uh, or more difficult to, to train not to predatory chase. Um, yeah, yeah, we had to train the German shepherds to bite. Uh, and we had to teach them to bite and hold. Um, the Mali, uh, anybody that tells you they've trained a Mali to bite is lying because all you do is try to train it not to bite. Um, they just love the tug game. They love that ragging so much. Um, German Shepherd uh, biting motor patterns um, tend to go sideways or backwards. Um, so when a, when a German Shepherd gets hold of the sleeve, which is what you're training in, in police work, um, they tend to mouth either sideways or backwards, which tends to mean that they come off the sleeve. So you have to work them on the sleeve to try and keep them on. Now, the Schutzhund dogs are, are much better than the, the old German Shepherds. The, the bred-to-work ones are much better at staying on the sleeve than the old Shepherds. But the Mali actually has a motor pattern uh, bred into it where it adjusts its bite forwards. So instead of adjusting sideways or backwards, it's coming forwards into the sleeve all the time. Um, and it, you can see it in his face when he's doing it, absolutely loves it. The first Mali we, uh, we as a police force got was from the Met, from their breeding program that they, they'd imported um, a couple of dogs from the continent. Um, and we took a, a Mali uh, from the Metropolitan Police and we got it as a, a 12 week old puppy. It had been through their uh, puppy process and came out the other end. We, we, we drove down, picked it up um, and a lovely, confident little dog. Um, never done any training at all and, and at 12 weeks I gave it to a handler and said just play with it and I'll see you in a couple of weeks um, and being a, a police dog handler the first thing he did was get it on a, on a tug and teach it to rag um, because that's what you would do with a German Shepherd dog start to build up the bite from an early age um, and he brought it back on a training day at 14 weeks uh, and he'd only had it a fortnight he'd only played tug with it for a fortnight um, and we couldn't get it off the sleeve at 14 weeks old. It was on the sleeve and it would not come off for us. Um, doing all the, you know, prizing its mouth open and, and you know, offering it something else instead. Um, and I took him aside and said, look, that's it. No more, no more practice. You don't, do, you don't practice any more of that. Um, because if we start to build that up now, uh, then by the time he gets to trainable at, at nine months old, it's, it's going to enjoy that so much that it's not going to want to do anything else in its life. Um, and, a, and a lot of the work that, that is spent on Mallys now is teaching them to come off the sleeve, um, which is fine if you want a, a, a lunatic dog that doesn't come off. Um, I know on the continent they use electric collars and they use electric, um, electric sleeves so that the, the out command uh, coincides with a, an, electric collar, an electric current passed through the sleeve, um, okay. which is a good way of getting your dog out, but... Not where I prefer to train. Uh huh. So, what do you think is the mistake then uh, uh, of moving over to the Malinois? You just uh, think I think it's the bite. They've... I think they're going to fail on the bite. They're, they're going to, as they get three, four years old, the bite becomes so enjoyable for them. You haven't got anything that they prefer to do. There isn't any way that you can get them back off. Um, the usual kind of police dog standard training is. Um, a conditioned leave or out command. Um, mm -hmm. I I do it with um, a, a, something preferable. I I've always I've always thought that a dog should come off because it believes that you've got something more important. Uh, and and I've always used the Kong um, just to get the dog back off again. So so the Kong is the most important thing in the dog's world, and it'll stop doing anything or leave anything in order to get access to that Kong. And, that, and that's how I train uh -huh. the, the out or the leave from the sleeve. But if, if the dog believes that the sleeve is more important than anything else, you're struggling to find something. Um, you, could give it, you could give it an alternative bite. You could give it a, a bite on a bite stick, um, which I know a lot of handlers do. But you're then very, very close to the edge where you, you're going to lose it. Um, all police dog training is a... Um, a compromise between uh, control and allowing the dog to do what it wants to do. Uh, and you, you have to have that very fine balance because we expect them to make decisions on their own. You know, do I go over the fence or not? Uh, you know, if you've been sent to chase a person, do I take that fence if I can't see the guy or do I come back? Um, and obviously you want the dog yeah. to make the decision to keep going once you've sent it until it's asked not to. Um, so it's got to make a lot of decisions by itself. Uh, do you think there's a difference in the enjoyment between biting a sleeve and biting a real person? Um, a difference in enjoyment. 
just bec- I only ask that because um, there's obviously people in IPO that managed to get the out. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, dogs dogs do enjoy biting people. There's no there's no doubt about it. There's a there's an extra thrill involved. Um, but um, what's the answer to the question? Did I, is there a difference in the sleeve and the people? Um, in individual dogs, yes, the, and and individual dogs will, will have a preference for, for biting people, but they'll always take the sleeve as well. Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, I, I because like I said, there's obviously the people that get an out with the Mallies in like IPO and in the sure. sports world. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of people doing it with force, but there's certainly people out there that are force oh, yeah. free as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, and, it's well, just the, more yeah, difficult, the, and, I guess. And the secret is not to build the bite up too much. If yeah. You, yeah, don't, or, okay. or don't allow the bite to build up too much. Yeah. Jemima was saying that there's also a lot of German Shepherd Mali crosses. Yeah. How, how do you feel about that? I mean, is that more of a compromise? What's the point? or? It's it, it's it, it's like labradoodles. What you know? What's the point? Um, you know, you've got a perfectly good poodle. You've got a perfectly good labrador, and or, or you know, what are you trying to gain from crossing the two? Well, I think uh, maybe you disagree, but I think a lot of people think there's a lot of structure issues now. With oh, absolutely, shepherds. yeah. But breed better shepherds. Yeah, confirmation, yeah. But breed breed better shepherds. Yeah, but uh, do you think that? You don't think that the crossing out to the Mali then is going to give you a dog that's that's more structurally better? Um, I mean, if you're if you're working dogs, is there any point in keeping them uh, pure bred? Absolutely not at all. Um, but if you're breeding crosses, then you don't quite know what you're going to get. Um, again, if I can refer you back to the Labradoodle, um, the, you, you don't you don't get half Labrador, half Poodle. You you get something uh, different in between, uh, and it'll be the same uh, temperamentally as well. Um, you don't necessarily know what you're going to get. You might get you might get a um, a whole German Shepherd temperament uh, and a Mali confirmation, or you might get a whole German Shepherd confirmation and a Mali yeah. temperament. Well, that's certainly the case on the first generation, isn't it? But I mean, as you start to, I mean, as you the project goes on and you get to your second and your third generations, you're going to get more of a consistent. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Dog. But that's that's making a new breed. That's not a crossbreed. Well, yeah, it's it's out. It's, I mean, we always call it out crossing, but yeah, I can see I can see your point. It's only out crossing um, up to a point, isn't it? You know, that, that, that's how all well, new I breeds guess start. It, you start by taking two different dogs and and getting standardisation. But do you see the Mali cross as a way of then going back into getting a more functional German um, Shepherd? It's happened with other breeds before. There's no reason why you can't, why you couldn't introduce some um, some different blood into a German Shepherd dog line and then. Get what you want from that, uh, and and cross back into German Shepherds again. Yeah, so so that's one way of improving the German Shepherd line. Yeah. Uh, what about as like sniffer dogs? How do you? I mean, I mean, I guess spaniels are used the most, aren't they? Um, yeah, spaniels labs. Yeah. Do you th- do you think that something like a Mali has any use in that kind of world? Um, I had a discussion with this, uh, with Karen Overall about this because she's involved in the in the US military training program and they train Mallies as sniffer dogs. Um, and the, it, it boiled down to the answer was they're easy to train. Um, by which I think she meant they're easier to control um, from a, um, a handling point of view. Um, the, the reason that I would always take a gun dog, a, a spaniel, or a Labrador over a Mali. If you're doing anything scent orientated, um, is because scenting's the default position for the for the gun dog, whereas it's not for the Mali. Mali's kind of general purpose. It, it can do everything as well. Um, um, but, but, but I'll give you an example. Um, the uh, when the um, um, Oh, I forgot what they're called. Um, cancer detection dogs. Um, there's a name for them. Ah, oh, I'm terrible. Um, anyway, when they when they first started training dogs for, um, uh, yeah, medical, medical detection, detection dogs. Those, that's them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. When, they, when they first started yeah. <laughs> training medical detection dogs, they they had a, a, a kind of a selection of dogs just to see if they could do it, um, just to see if they could um, um, train dogs to detect cancer from from urine samples. 
Um, and they did it with Labrador Spaniels, and they, they had a Chihuahua as well. Um, and when they when they actually uh, did the tests, they would bring the dogs out every day and, and run through the tests, uh, which comprised of asking the dog to detect one positive sample out of six uh, negative samples. Um, and the the thing about the Chihuahua was that it was as good as the, it, its success rate was as good as all the other breeds of dogs, the Labradors and Spaniels. Um, so its its nose was equally as good, but there were days when you would bring it out and it just couldn't be bothered to do it. It just wouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. So and it would only it wasn't wasn't as though anybody was hammering it, making it do it. You know, perform, perform, perform. It was just, would you do this test for us today? And the Chihuahua would go, no, I can't be bothered. And that's yeah. that's the difference between dogs that are orientated towards scent work. I always I always used to say, all all we have to do when we get offered a, a scenting dog uh, as a police dog to go and test it is to put it on the floor, and if he puts his nose down and keeps searching until you pick it up again, that's the kind of dog you want. If it, if it stops and looks around, then that's probably not the kind of dog you want. Uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised that you, you say that uh, with the comparison to Labs and Mallys, though, because Mallys are obviously quite well known for having a lot of drive to yeah, work. Yeah, drive to work's not the same as um, drive to search. Um, Drive to work is uh, wanting to please, wanting to go out and do things, whereas scent work isn't really the desire to please somebody, it's the desire to please itself. Um, and that's fine for me. I'm, I'm quite happy if it wants to please itself by scenting because I can do all the control aspects of it. That's just dog training. Um, yeah. The problem comes with the Mali is, um, for example, uh, if, you, if you go on a drugs bust, um, then it can be quite noisy. Uh, the door will get kicked in, there'll be people screaming, there'll be toilets flushing, there'll be all hell breaking loose. Well, that's quite stressful for a dog. So if your stress response is to go into a behaviour that you find comforting, then if you're a spaniel, that's searching. And that's exactly what you want the spaniel to do. If your stress response for a Mali is to get a bit defensive and start barking at people, then that's not what you want from a search dog. And okay. that's that's the difference for me. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure I'm sure that they can both do an excellent job. But I can see what you're saying completely um, as as the stress response. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Um, was a lot of your work in the police at that point quite force free or I mean, a lot of people associate the police, certainly in the past, with using a lot of harsh methods. Um, absolutely. We all used harsh methods in, in the past. That was that was how we were taught to do it. We were taught from a book that basically hadn't changed since uh, probably the First World War. Um, uh, it was probably based on Conrad Most um, and his, his dog training book, um, which was good for its time because everything was good for its time. Um, but they were also of their time. Um, and yeah... Um, there were obviously a lot of uh, forceful methods used. I mean, the, the method of training a dog to sit was to push down on its bottom and lift uh, lift the lead high on its neck. Um, uh-huh. uh, but however, that, that I think, uh, I'm not taking any credit for it, but I think the time that I was um, working police dogs was the time that everything started to change. Um, and so I, I, I saw the best of, or the, or the worst of one world and the best of the next world. Um, where we were, where okay. we were basically using almost totally force-free methods by the time we got to the end. Uh huh. The, the, in in other parts of the world, there's still um, a lot of that kind of going on. Do you think that with just with time that those those areas yeah, have changed? Yeah, things are changing uh, globally, and, and and change takes time. Uh, of course, it does. Um, but the more people that get on board with it, then the quicker it's going to change. Uh-huh. Okay, cool. Um, how? I mean, this is completely changed the su- subject again. But how did you come up with your methods with for chasing and also for um, uh, dogs of bite? Um, right. Well, I could take chasing first because that's that's relatively easy because that that kind of came from um, from the police to start with, um, and it 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 all came from the point at which we decided or, or I decided that it was better, uh, both from a results point of view and from the dog's point of view, to train dogs for something rather than, uh, for a reward, rather than 
training dogs to do something because they were told to do it. The old way of training police dogs was you will do it because you've been told to do it. Um, the new way is I've got something that you want and if you do something that I ask then I'll provide it for you. Um, and it, it all came down to the Kong in the pocket. Um, and, it, uh, and it didn't start as Kongs, it started before Kongs. I used to, my, my first dog's toy was um, a cat's eye from the middle of the road. Uh, because yeah. they, they, they were rubber and they bounced in a funny way. Um, I, I took the shiny bits out so there were no metal parts in it. Um, and they were easily yeah. replaced. I think, it, I think um, Americans and whatnot are going to listen to this and think you literally mean a, oh, sorry, a cat's eye. A cat's eye. <laughs> what, what do they really call them in America? Um, it's, a, it's a piece of rubber that used to sit in the middle of the road. Um, uh, and, and it yeah, had shiny bits in that we call cat's eyes because they reflect in the darkness. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it was a brilliant piece of kit because it went in my pocket and I could throw it for a dog and it would bounce. Uh, and it, and it, if I'd if I'd had the the nouse about myself, I would have invented them as a dog toy <laughs> because a lot of them got pulled out of the road and just burned as they got replaced with new ones. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, so it went from just kind of a, a change to positive training and then it kind of manifested itself. Yeah, sure. Then. Um, I, I know, and so we basically constantly started to look for things that we could use to motivate our dogs uh, and motivate them in a way that would make them uh, controllable as well. Um, and it was all down to the, um, if you do as I ask or if you don't do as what you're doing now, then I can give this to you. And, and usually it would end up as a, as a, as a con. Um, uh-huh. and, and I guess, does that also apply to your dogs that bite um, stuff then? Yes, in a way, um, but that's that's more about changing the emotion. In 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 predatory chasing dogs, it's about changing the target. It's about making the making the thing that I've got for you more attractive than the thing that you can do on your own. Um, in in dog aggression, it's it's always about changing the emotion uh, because if you can change the, emo- the, the the emotion underlying the dog's behaviour then you can change the dog's behaviour. But you, in the same way, I, I use toys for that too. Uh-huh. Yeah, do you change... I mean, when you're talking about changing emotion, um, are you going through a, a counter-conditioning process? Um, yes. It's, all, it's always counter-conditioning and, and with an element of desensitisation as well. Um, uh, in fact, I'd probably go as far as to say um, all training of dogs not to be aggressive involves counter-conditioning of, of some way, shape or form. And, and, the, sure. and the important thing is the is the change in the emotional aspect from the dog's point of view, and that applies to bat training as, as as much as anything else. You know, it's all it's all about getting the dog to change it, the way that it views the situation. Uh huh. Is dogs that bite um, your seminar um, an explanation of how to to do it, or is it? more of your own style of, of how we go to we go right the way it. through it um we go from from why dogs do it right the way through um changing the dog's perception of the owner and then changing the reliance that the dog can place on the owner um my my own personal preferred way of doing it which i've, I've done with a few dogs that, I, that, that i've had as well um is to um allow the dog to have a different way of expressing their worries about about what's in front of them um, and that's really about the relationship that they have with the owner rather than um, them, them being not afraid of anything else um, it's, so is that is that putting an emphasis on their body language then um putting an emphasis on, on their body language um it's and paying attention well, to it i mean yeah i mean we we all have to, we all should pay more attention to our dog's body language because we don't. Um, but it's about recognizing the state that the dog's in from the body language, and then allowing the dog to change it. Yeah, but it's it's not about uh, it's not that. Put it that way. Yeah. Okay. But like I said, I've never seen it, so I, I'm just I'm going. Uh, it's okay. Blind. It's 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 extremely simple. Um, the the whole point about what I the, 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 what I can can give people is that anybody can do it, uh, and everybody can do it. Because as, as I've said before, I I firmly believe that I can change any dog for the better, 
Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to. There are some dogs that I wouldn't enjoy working with um, because they're, they're, they can be extremely dangerous. Um, but I believe that it is possible. Um, what I want to get across is that there are techniques that any owner can use to improve their dog's behaviour. Uh, and that's, that's really what mine's about. It's about things that absolutely anybody can do with absolutely any dog. Yeah, sure. I mean, and, and when I went to your talk, you were also talking about um, being in court and defending dogs. Is that something you do? Yeah, quite sure. Regularly? Um, uh, as an expert, it's not uh, it's not my position to actually defend dogs. It's my position to to tell the honest truth to the court, um, and that's what all experts should do. It, it shouldn't be a question of coming down on one side or the other. It should be a question. It should be a yeah, question of enough. saying, you know, yeah. this is what I believe about this dog. Um, uh, yeah, and, and and giving your honest opinion to the court. Uh, and there are occasions when I've been to court and said, no, actually, I, I don't believe that dog's safe in the circumstances in which it is. Um, and, and unfortunately, that, that is the case on some occasions. Um, so it works both ways. But um, happily, um, probably um, it's a two-thirds, third split in favour of the dog. Um, and, and to be honest, the, the third don't usually get to go to court anyway because... If if I can't find that it's safe, then the owner is probably going to accept my my um, opinion anyway. Um, yeah. Because if I if if I don't think it can be made safe, then really good luck to anybody else who's going to give it a go. Sure. Do you also t- um, do dogs for breed specific legislation reasons? Absolutely. So yeah. Kind yeah. Of yeah sure. And such? Yeah. We've uh, I've seen I've seen uh, dogs and what's that, your... that, that some police officers have alleged that were. Uh, of the type of the pit bull terrier and disagreed with them and 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 uh, found in in favour of um, the dog not being a pit bull terrier. Yeah, absolutely. And what's your opinion when it comes to pit bulls? Um, I mean, there's it's something I get asked sometimes as well. Like, I mean, a lot of people wonder if they are these kind of animals that are just so aggressive or if they're just a normal dog. Um, well, we've got we've got a couple of definition problems to start with, haven't we? Because we shouldn't have any pit bulls in in the country because they were they were banned in 1991, um, and so they'd, they'd have to be what 20 odd years old by now, um, so there really shouldn't be any. Um, but what we've got are dogs that are conforming to what the courts have determined to be of the type of pit bull terrier. Um, now that that's just a crossbred dog, and so it could be any kind of crossbreed that just happens to look like a pit bull terrier. The, the thing we haven't got is dogs that behave like pit bull terriers, because there there is no standard behaviour confirmation for a crossbred dog that happens to look like a pit bull terrier. So it's very variable. Um, the the common denominator that you have is they tend to have quite big heads and powerful jaws, uh, which means that when they go wrong, then it can be seriously wrong. And that's the difficulty that, that we're having with them at the moment, is that when, when dogs go wrong, um, then then they get labelled as being a bad pit bull terrier. But I don't believe there are any more dogs of the pit bull terrier type that go wrong than there are dogs of most of the breeds that go wrong. Do you believe that we should end breed specific legislation? Um, then? Only from the point of view that it's not working. Uh, it just it just doesn't yeah. work, um, and it's it's causing huge amount of grief and a huge amount of um, uh, problems for all manner of um, all manner of different agencies. Not to not to mention the police. The police have got huge problems with it. They're expending far too much money on chasing around picking up dogs that that look a bit like a pit bull terrier. Um, now, from their point of view, they're in they're in a cleft stick. Because if somebody rings up and says, I believe the guy next door to a pit bull terrier, they don't do anything about it, then once they know that uh, an offence has been suspected, then if they haven't followed it up and something bad happens later, um, then, then they, could, they could end up with a corporate manslaughter charge. Um, so it's, it's okay. really tough from a police point of view um, because of the legislation that we've got at the moment. Um, but it's also really tough on the owners who, who get a staffy cross puppy and it grows up to look like a pit bull terrier. Yeah, sure. Um, obviously, your DVDs... Uh, your, I'm skipping to a question. I was going to say, your books have been so successful. Um, I, I find it really surprising. I don't know. You, you haven't done any no, DVDs, have you? No, I, I haven't got time. I haven't got time to do this, to be honest, Nick. Oh, I think it would be awesome. I think it would be amazing to see 
what you're what you talk about in a DVD form. Right. Okay. Awesome. I'll bear that in mind. I'll think about it. But it's not something you. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something, it's not something I'm rushing into at the moment. No. I'm trying to retire. <laughs> I'm trying to. I'm trying to not do as much work. Well, I'm trying to get more yeah, out of my okay. hobbies of um, of motorcycling and drinking beer. All oh, right. Okay. Although sure, not not both sure. at the same but time. You... Yeah, but you've wrote um, multiple books, uh, haven't you? Yeah, I've got so four. It... Yeah, there's four books. Yeah. And if you let, could you let people know where to get those books and also the titles? Oh, of hey. them? Um, I, I wish I'd, I wish I'd prepared better now. Okay. Well, there's there's, 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 there's stop. The there's predatory chase. Um, um, you can get them all on Amazon, basically. Um, they're, they're all they're all generally available on on Amazon. In fact, Amazon can sometimes do them at, at a cheaper price than I can get them from the publisher. Um, so so Amazon's probably your yeah. best start point. At all of my seminars, uh, I take along a selection of books as well. So anybody that goes to the seminars can can buy one or or, or lots of them if you like. Um, so there's, there's there's stop the predatory chase book, um, which was the first one. Be- because I wrote stop, um, I referred to it uh, in I, I referred to dog training terms in it, and I, and I kind of wrote a bit about you need to be able to have some skills for training your dog in it. And people kept asking me, well, how do I get the dog skills? So then I had to write Dog Secrets, which is just a basic dog training book. It's just it's just um, a dog training book for owners, really. Um, but it explains how to go about training your dogs in, in simple things, um, which was fine. Then I wrote um, Bite and Fight, um, which was my, my next big project, really, because I've, I've always wanted to try and explain to people how they can control their aggression in their pet dogs. Um, so, so then Bite and Fight came about. And in Bite and Fight, um, I talked about learn to earn, which is a, a kind of a, um, a relationship uh, concept. Um, and, and people didn't really understand that as much as I'd like them to do. Um, and so I changed it and I, I changed it into guide and control, which is the relationship um, uh, program for, for people to change the relationship with their dogs. Um, and so I wrote a book on that as well. Um, and that does really well um, in um, um, rescues because it's a really good program to put your dog straight into when you get a rescue dog. Um, and so I find that rescues by by the bite in lumps and then and then either give them away or sell them to people who are rescuing dogs at the same time. So that's about your relationship with dogs. Um, but that's just that's just a short booklet. That's only like 40 pages or something. Um, but you can get them all on Amazon or you can get them all on my website. Um, um, what was your website? Dog for? Secrets. Um, which again, I, I didn't really mean to call Dog Secrets. It was it's supposed to be ironic um, because I, I firmly believe that there aren't any secrets. Uh, in training mm-hmm. dogs, it's all just just common sense and and applying the principles, um, and that and the people who say, oh, I've got the secret of training dogs, then it, it's it's all just stuff we already know repackaged, um, and so it's dog-secrets.co.uk. Um, and then you also have a Facebook I do, page, which is it? again, you see, I didn't mean to call myself dog expert either. <laughs> I've accidentally done all this stuff because it, it sounds it sounds up myself and I, I don't mean it to be like that at all. It was so um, it, it, it's basically for, for solicitors who are looking for a dog expert to to instruct in court cases, um, and so obviously the search terms are dog and expert, and so I thought well if I make the sure. Facebook page dog expert then they'll find it quickly and easily, um, and so that's what it's about really. Yeah. It's, it's about ease of access uh, and I'm. I, I, so the the dog expert, although it sounds as though I'm being a bit cocky, really, it's not. It's really about search terms, so that people can find me when they want to find me for for a court case. Uh huh. So literally, they just search dog expert. Yeah, absolutely. On it's, it's it's David Ryan, dog expert. Cool. Awesome. All right, David. It's really yes, nice and to you. you. Uh, all right, brilliant. Well, I'll I'll leave you to enjoy okay. the rest of your day. I'll go and drink some beer on a motorbike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Cheers, Nick. Bye, Thanks, David. Thanks. Bye.